still get used to. I worked from home last year, so he's still getting used to. Yeah, he's not thrilled. Good morning. Yeah. Welcome to Health and Human Services Committee. We feel we are the finest community here in the building, and we'll give you the opportunity to determine that on your own in a little while. My name is Senator Brian Harden. I represent the 48th Legislative District, which is Kimball, Banner, Scotts Bluff County, way out west, where it actually snows a lot. And uh, I serve as the Vice Chair of Health and Human Services Committee. I'd like to invite the members of the committee to introduce themselves, starting on my right with Senator Ballard. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Bo Ballard, District 21, Northwest Lincoln and Northern Lancaster County. Good morning, Senator Jen Day. I represent Legislative District 49 in Serpy County. Good morning, Lynn Walls. I represent Legislative District 15, which is Dodge County and Valley. Uh, Michaela Cavanaugh, District 6, West Central Omaha, Douglas County. Murph Reapy, District 12, Southwest Omaha and the City of Ralston. Also assisting the committee is our legal counsel, Benson Wallace, research analyst, Bryson Bartels, our committee clerk, Christina Campbell, and our committee pages, Sophia and Mattia. Thanks for being here. A few notes about our policies and procedures. Please turn off your cell phone or make it quiet, please. We will be uh, hearing bills today and taking them in the order listed on the agenda outside the room. Um, on each of the tables near the doors of the hearing room, you will find green testifier sheets. If you're planning to testify today, please fill one out, hand it to Christina when you come up to testify. Uh, this will help us keep an accurate record of the hearing. If you're not testifying at the microphone, but want to go on record as having a position on a bill being heard today, there are white sign-in sheets in each at each entrance where you may leave your name and other pertinent information. Also, I would note if you are not testifying, but have an online position comment to submit the legislature's policy is that all comments for the record must be received by the committee by noon the day prior to the hearing. Any handouts submitted by testifiers will also be included as part of the record as exhibits. We would ask if you do have any handouts that you please bring 10 copies and give them to the page. We use a light system up here on the desk for testifying. Each testifier will have five minutes to testify. When you begin, the light will be green. When the light turns yellow, what do you suppose that means? Speed up, don't slow down, okay? <laughs> Speak like an auctioneer at that point. When the light turns red, it's time to end your testimony and we will ask you to wrap up your final thoughts. When you come up to testify, please begin by stating your name clearly into the mic and then spell your first name and last. That's what the rookies typically fail to do. You don't want to be like them. Okay. The hearing on each bill will begin with the introducer's opening statement. After the opening statement, we will hear from supporters of the bill, then from those in opposition, followed by those speaking in the neutral capacity. The introducer of the bill will then be given the opportunity to make closing statements if they wish to do so. On a side note, the reading of testimony that is not your own is not allowed unless previously approved. We have a strict no prop policy in this committee. With that, we will begin with LB 337. Welcome, Senator Reaping. and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I confess I'm, I'm worried because our, our main questioner is sitting there instead of here. So I have been known as Curious George, so uh, <laughs> I do have questions. Thanks for being here. My name is Merv Reepy. It's M-E-R-V, last name is Reepy, R-I-E-P-E, and I represent the 12th District, which consists of Southwest Omaha and the city of Ralston. Individuals with mental illness are over overrepresented at every stage of the criminal justice process. Effective responses for these individuals require and depend on collaboration 
between the criminal, clinic, criminal justice and behavioral health systems. A crucial component of this cross-system collaboration is information sharing, particularly information about the health and treatment of people with mental illness who are the focus of these responses. <clears throat> the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, more commonly known as HIPAA, is often cited by mental health practitioner as the greatest barrier to information exchange. However, it's not HIPAA that prevents this exchange, but current Nebraska state law. Not unlike other states, Nebraska's mental health confidentiality laws were enacted at a time when cross-system care was not a major part of healthcare, and most healthcare records were on paper. This has resulted in inconsistencies between federal and state laws. Ohio and Texas are two states who have recently revised their confidenti confidentiality laws to be consistent with HIPAA. Current Nebraska statutes are far more restrictive and impede identifying individuals with mental illness and developing effective plans for appropriate diversion, treatment, and transitions between the criminal justice system and the community. LB337 would revise Nebraska state law to align with HIPAA, significantly decreasing the barriers associated with sharing information between the behavioral health and criminal justice systems, allowing mental health practitioners to share protected health information without consent to provide coordinated or managed treatments as allowed by HIPAA. On the record, LB337 is supported by the Nebraska chapter of the National Association of Social Workers, the Nebraska Association of Behavioral Health Organization, and the NACD, which is the Association for County Governments, who understand that by passing LB337 and eliminating the barriers of requiring the written consent to share necessary mental health information for continuity of care and treatment will in turn lessen the severity of interactions with law enforcement, provide for more appropriate care of incarcerated individuals and shorten the period of involvement with the criminal justice system. I might note that there is no fiscal note associated with this request uh, for LB337. Thank you for your time and attention. I would take any questions in hopes that I could answer. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, Senator Cavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reapy. I felt like I should take up your mantle of asking questions. Um, when was this, what you're, so you're repealing something that was put in statute. Do you know when it was put in statute? The original one, I understand, and there may be people coming behind me, but I'm told it's 25 years ago. Do you happen to know the reason that it was put into statute? Well, at that time, uh, Nebraska, along with several other states, enacted its own its own mental health confidentiality laws, and that predated HIPAA. Okay. So they were very strict, but then HIPAA came along, and there's some legislation that specifically that HIPAA does, in fact, uh, allow for this at this time. Okay. And I, in my notes here, I have some reference to that. It was under the final HIPAA issues or rules at 45 CRF 164.506 covered entities, including healthcare providers may disclose protected health information for treatment purposes. And that is HIPAA. Um, your bill goes beyond the treatment purposes and it says as allowed by law. And I saw one of the opposition letters had concerns over that being a very broad. Um, let's see here, the law as otherwise permitted by law. Is that is it in your intention to have it that broad or is that something that you- well, I think the, uh, the opposition letter was from a trial attorney. Yeah. And his biggest or her business biggest one was they wanted to have the one word in the bill that said, uh, I think it was 
We wanted it to change from uh, preferred or, or required uh, to permitted. They wanted it changed to required as opposed to permitted. Uh, I would let them speak to what what their interpretation. The oftentimes mm -hmm. sure. there can be great meaning in the change of one word, as you know. I do, and as you know, I'm not actually a lawyer, so <laughs> I will. But you're awfully good at. <laughs> I will I will ask lawyers to explain that further. Um, you mentioned paper um, records, and I just wanted to note, because you talked about the criminal justice system and paper records, that currently our correction system does not have electronic records for um, patients, which is... They do not, you said? They do not, which is, I believe, problematic in continuity of care when people are released from corrections, but a conversation for another day. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. Other questions? Seeing none, Senator Reapy, will you stick around? Yes, I later? will. I will. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Those in support of LB 337, feel free to make your way to the microphone. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, um, Vice Chair Hardin and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Kim Etherton, K-I-M-E-T-H-E-R-T-O-N. I am a licensed independent mental health practitioner and the director of Lancaster County Community Corrections, and I am here to support LB 337. The Department of Community Corrections works closely with agencies across the criminal justice intercepts to identify individuals eligible for one of the 16 programs available through the department. Once identified, we move these individuals out of the criminal justice system as soon as reasonably possible and into a program tailored to meet their needs. These programs provide support, structure, access to behavioral health services, cognitive restructuring, and case management or supervision. Community Corrections' five pretrial diversion programs administered in partnership with the city and county prosecutor's offices are examples of interventions at the early intercepts of the criminal justice system. Diversion programming, specifically mental health diversion, veterans, and treatment diversion, will benefit from LB 337 as it removes the barrier created by state statute, which restricts information sharing between the prosecutors and my department staff. The sooner we're made aware of behavioral health history and the circumstances surrounding their interface with the criminal justice system, the sooner we can begin service coordination. In January 2019, I was invited to attend a training in Omaha sponsored by Region 6 Behavioral Health, where the focus was behavioral health data and information sharing. The expert trainer at this session was John Petrilla. Mr. Petrill is an attorney and national expert on mental health law and policy and information sharing. Mr. Petrill was on the team of attorneys who drafted the HIPAA legislation, and he wrote the chapter on confidentiality uh, for the 1999 Surgeon General's report. At that training, Mr. Petrill explained that HIPAA is not what is getting in the way of Nebraska sharing limited behavioral health information. In almost all cases, it is state statute that stands in the way. LB 337 addresses this barrier. We all work with limited resources and removing barriers that impede the process of identifying the behavioral health needs of individuals will help us use time and resources more efficiently. In addition, we can stop further progression of these individuals into the criminal justice system. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Senator Reapy, almost major doctor. <laughs> thank you, Senator Reapy, for introducing LB 337, and thank you, Senators, for your time. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for being here. Questions? That Seeing sense. none, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else in support of LB 337? Thank you for being here. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Sharon Price, and that's spelled S-H-A-R-O-N-P-R-I-C-E. Thank you, everyone. I'm honored to be here. I am a behavioral health coordinator statewide in the state of Nebraska. I graduated from the Nebraska School for the Deaf in 1997 and graduated from Shadron State College with a bachelor's in social work. I got my master's at Gallaudet University. After that, I worked in Cincinnati, Ohio as a community health case manager for approximately 13 years, working with the deaf and hard of hearing population who have severe and and ongoing mental health problems. I followed HIPAA and they allowed us to exchange information, sharing that with corrections and hospitals. If the person maybe was not in the right frame of mind, we could make sure that the person had the appropriate level of care needed, the right medication to get them stabilized again. Since I've been here, of April of last year with my position here, I happened to have an opportunity to meet the father of a person who contacted us. The person was deaf and lived in Omaha. They were off their medication for a while and they got involved in some legal issues and some hospital issues because of the law that we have in the state of Nebraska, which prevented them from sharing any information. The father had to drive here from Texas to try to get his son the, the help that he needed. If LB337 is passed, that would help situations such as that, especially for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, not only to get stabilized, but to make sure that they have interpreters, access to communication accommodations that they need, just like what we did in Ohio. So not only services for their drug and alcohol use, but also for communication access. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll answer any questions if you would like. Thank you, and thank you from a fellow CSC Eagle. Oh, thank you. Questions, committee? Seeing none. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Anyone else in support of LB337? Good morning. My name is Vicki Vega, spelled V-I-C-K-I-M-A-C-A. And I am the Director of Criminal Justice and Behavioral Health Initiatives with Region 6 Behavioral Health Care, serving Cass, Dodge, Douglas, Starkey, and Washington counties. I am a licensed mental health practitioner and a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm here to testify in support of LB337. For the past five years, I've been responsible for leading the Stepping Up Initiative, a national initiative that provides technical assistance and support to communities working to reduce the number of individuals with a serious mental illness who are in jail. This data-driven initiative is heavily focused on collaboration and driving systems level improvements. National data shows that 20% of individuals in jail have a serious mental illness. These individuals remain in jail longer than other inmates, are victimized in disproportionate numbers and experience worsening of their mental illness symptoms. To improve these and other outcomes for this very vulnerable population, information regarding their care and coordination of treatment activities must seamlessly flow back and forth between the criminal justice and mental health systems. Without the ability to share information across systems, individuals experience delays in accessing community-based services and, needed, and their needed medications, changes in treatment providers, and multiple assessments, which result in a loss of continuity of care and duplication of treatment efforts. Stepping Up provides a monthly opportunity to formally meet with representatives from behavioral health and criminal justice in both Douglas and Sarpy County. 
Both of these teams have consistently identified information sharing between the mental health and criminal justice systems as a primary system challenge impacting incarcerations, their length of stay, connections to care, and recidivism. In January of 2019, Region 6 Behavioral Health Care hosted a conference featuring John Petrella, president of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute in Texas and an attorney with 40 years of experience in mental health law and policy. <clears throat> Mr. Petrella provided valuable information about the value and impact of information sharing. He delivered a comprehensive review of HIPAA and then took time to brainstorm next steps with us to improve our cross-system information sharing. The brainstorming session was very short as it quickly became clear that when it comes to information sharing in Nebraska, HIPAA was not our barrier, but Nebraska Revised Statute 3821-36 was and still is today. Current law only allows those who are licensed pursuant to the Nebraska Mental Health Practice Act to disclose information about their client with written consent of the person or when there is a duty to warn circumstance. Unfortunately, there are many situations where individuals are unable or unwilling to consent. From the criminal justice perspective, it is di extremely difficult for a jail to conduct effective discharge planning make referrals to community-based agencies or prescribe the most effective medications without having the necessary information or history. On the other hand, without consumer consent, community-based mental health practitioners are unable to share information with jail personnel, even when they know the individual they have been treating is incarcerated. LV337 aligns state law with the federal privacy HIPAA laws and permits the disclosure of information without consent in certain situations. HIPAA does not allow unlimited disclosure of information or infer that obtaining consent is never necessary. HIPAA permits healthcare providers to disclose to other healthcare providers protected health information for the purposes of treatment activities and coordination of care. LB337 will assure that individuals' health information is properly protected while allowing the flow of health information needed to provide and promote <coughs> high quality care. LB337 strikes a balance that permits important uses of information while protecting the privacy of people who are seeking care. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony. Thank are, you. There, are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, now you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody who wishes, who else wishes to testify in support? Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Jacob Betsworth, spelled J-A-C-O-B-B-E-T-S-W-O-R-T-H. And I'm a lieutenant with the Sarpy County Sheriff's Office. Uh, appearing before you today in support of LB337. I would like to thank Senator Reepy for introducing this bill, which will provide a much needed tool for law enforcement to help individuals get the assistance that they need. When law enforcement responds to incidents with individuals having a mental health crisis, our response is only as good as the information that we can obtain. Self-attestation is the primary source of information we receive, which can be minimal during a mental health crisis. Knowing what mental health services an individual has or are currently receiving will allow law enforcement to intervene quickly and effectively. Law enforcement can then take the individual to the place they have received services before or call on a doctor that the individual knows and trusts. I'll go off script here for just a second. Um, I've been a law enforcement officer for 22 years, and when I first started, uh, uh, mental health and law enforcement were two very separate entities, and that is not the case anymore. We actually started a mental health unit at the sheriff's office with deputies who are sensitive to mental health issues uh, to respond to those in crisis. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is uh, embed a co-responder, a mental health professional, to actually ride with the deputies, um, it's best national practice, um, and respond to the calls. As the state statute sits today, that co-responder uh, could go to, to John Doe's house and have met with John Doe 20 times before. And when they go get in the car and leave, that uh, co-responder cannot tell the deputy who is in the car with them uh, the history of that person or where they, where they seek care before. And so that's a barrier for us. Um, and so it's one of the things that we're trying to fix. Uh, law enforcement wants to uh, be a good steward and to get people who are in mental health crisis to the care that they need the most and to divert them from the criminal justice system when it's appropriate 
uh, so that they can get the care that they need and so that there's not, uh, you know, repeated calls and we can get them the help that they need. And so uh, LBE 337 will keep the people we serve uh, and law enforcement safe and safer. And I urge the committee to advance LB 337 out of committee. Uh, thank you all for your time and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Yes. And for your service to Surfy County. Happy um, to serve. How does this work? Because I mean, when you get a call, Sure. I'm just very intrigued by yeah, this yeah, process. And I I'm, I'm appreciate that mental health is being put forward a little bit more. But when you get a call and somebody is having a mental health crisis, how would this particular bill give you access in that situation to sure. the information you need? Absolutely. Uh, in many ways. First of all, it allows the call responder that we're with and criminal justice to um, share information. So we'll use John Doe as an example. John Doe is a frequent caller, has mental health issues. Um, let's say that co-responder has history with John Doe. And, and who would the co-responder be? The what? co-responder is a mental health professional who's embedded with the uh, deputies. Ah, yeah. okay, now I'm getting kind it. Kind of like a ride-along program, but sure. uh, with an expert. And so uh, law enforcement are not mental health experts. We are quickly being thrown into the arena where we have to learn uh, to, to you know, be cognizant of those things, but we are not the experts. And so... What we want to do is uh, have that co-responder with us. And then when we go to a call for service, I guess backing up, this will help. Um, most mental health crises, uh, law enforcement is called. That's how we know there's a crisis, right? They, they don't necessarily just show up to the hospital, although they do. But most of the time, there's a 911 call, deputies respond. And so we're trying to divert um, people in mental health crisis out of the uh, criminal justice system when we can. Mm -hmm. And also, because we're, serve, we're servants, we're trying to get them to... Uh, mental health uh, help as soon as we can. And so this will allow us to share the information to get them to the right help sooner, if that makes sense. And this co-responder, is this a program that's been going on for a while or is this new? Is this just um, Sarby County? Yeah, in, in some way, uh, Sarby County is not the first in the state of Nebraska. My understanding is I think uh, Lancaster and Lincoln maybe has a, a co-responder unit. I think Douglas County um, has one within the last year and uh, our goal is to get one uh, hopefully in the next six months. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Thank it you. is very, very. Uh, I've learned something new today. Yeah, it's, it's new stuff, and it's, it's very good for law enforcement, and it's very good for uh, practitioners in mental health as well. Thank you. Thanks for testifying. Absolutely. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify in support? Morning. My name is Ashley Berg, spelled A-S-H-L-E-Y-B-E-R-G. I am a member of the Nebraska chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker and have worked in the field of criminal justice for the last seven years. I'm here today to support LB337. Through my work in the criminal justice field and from a criminal justice perspective, Nebraska Statute 38-2136 is a major barrier to providing treatment and informed continuity of care to individuals with a mental illness who become involved in the criminal justice system. Aligning Nebraska Statute 38-2136 with HIPAA would allow for the disclosure of confidential information for purposes of treatment or continuity of care when written consent cannot be obtained. HIPAA specifies that when this disclosure is allowed without written consent, it applies only to the minimum amount of protected health information needed to accomplish the intended purpose of the disclosure. I find it important to point out that while LB337 seeks to align Nebraska Statute 38-2136 with HIPAA, the bill does not allow for unlimited disclosure of information, nor does it say that one should not try to obtain written consent, nor does it say that one should proceed with the disclosure of information without consent when consent can be obtained. Successful collaboration between criminal justice and mental health is only as good as the information available to the professionals working in those fields. At so many points on the spectrum of criminal justice, individuals are met with uninformed responses because the individual cannot provide written consent to allow for the disclosure of their medication, crisis plan, treatment providers, and overall mental health treatment plan. Uninformed responses can lead to chaotic and risky interactions with law enforcement, longer stays in jail, and mental health relapse. From a provider perspective, all of the progress an individual has made with treatment and medication compliance while in the community can be thrown out the window if the individual experiences a crisis, 
comes into contact with law enforcement and is then booked into jail. If the treating provider is unable to contact the jail to inform them of the medication that individual is taking, the jail is forced to operate without any information. Not all jails have fully staffed mental health units either, so if we're looking at a small rural jail, this could mean the individual may be sitting for days or even weeks before being seen by a prescribing provider to even get back on medication. This would likely cause an extended stay in the jail and ineffective discharge planning and potentially a duplication of services upon release. If I was the provider and able to share the necessary information with the local jail, all of this could be avoided. LB337 seeks to remove barriers to the treatment and continuity of care in these types of situations. Nebraska Statute 38-2136 predates HIPAA and has been in place since at least 1999, whereas HIPAA privacy regulations went into effect in 2002. So I think it is time for Nebraska to look at why our state statute remains in conflict with a federal regulation. It is for these reasons that I'm asking the LB337 be advanced out of committee. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Ballard. Thank you, Chair Hanson. Um, you said you've been working in the criminal justice for the last field for the last seven years. Yep. Have you had any experience where this has been a barrier? Yes. Okay. So I work in the public defender's office as a social worker. And when we have individuals get booked in experiencing an acute psychosis, uh, maybe they're intoxicated. Um, what I find actually more frequently is that they can't remember who their provider is. Um, so from my experience, there is an, a daily arrest report that goes out to the community providers. So they are able to see who was booked into the jail, which would give them the opportunity to call into the jail and say, hey, we're treating this person. Here's the medication that they're taking. But Nebraska statute doesn't allow for that if they don't have that written consent. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one question. If you can't answer, maybe somebody behind you can, or unless I missed it already. Um, at the end of the, the section that's underlined that they're trying to change, do you know what or as otherwise permitted by law means? I, I don't know that I can answer that. I'm not an attorney. Um, you just look like you knew everything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Okay, no, that's fine. Maybe somebody else can answer it or, you know. I can look into it too. I, I can ask them. More for curiosity's sake, just, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, and thank you for your testimony too. Uh, anybody else wishing to testify in support of LB337? All right, seeing none, is there anybody wish to testify in opposition to LB337? Seeing none, is there anybody who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Okay, seeing none. Well, we will welcome Senator Reepy to close. And for the record, we did have uh, six letters in support of LB337 and one letter in opposition. Chairman Hanson, thank you. I just want to come and, and summarize a little bit on, with four points. Cross-system care is the key. Individuals benefit, families benefit, the community benefits. It complies with HIPAA. And now is the time for Nebraska to join Ohio, Texas, and other states in updating statutes to promote cross-system care. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> and that will close the hearing on LB337. And we'll move on to the next one, which is... LB 345 and welcome up, welcome up Senator Armendariz. <laughs> Who I think it's the first time she's been trying HHS. Right? First time, yeah. I'm trying to keep it to a minimum. The best committee. <laughs> so I heard from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See? We're I, I believe communication you. with each other. That's I believe you, but it is yet to be seen. So we'll find out. <laughs> Thanks, Chairman uh, Hansen, for having me today and the rest of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Christy Armendariz, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y-A-R-M-E-N-D-A-R-I-Z, and I represent Legislative District 18 in Northwest Omaha and Bennington. And today I appear before you to introduce LB 345. LB 345 amends the Health Care Facility Licensure Act to include a definition for palliative care. 
we probably have all heard this term and associate it with hospice care. Um, but it is exactly, it, it is, it, that is exactly why we need to pass this bill. Palliative care is separate and different than hospice care. So after today's testimony, we hope that we clarify why we need a clear definition that is separate and different um, from hospice. Palliative care is specialized treatment that is for anyone with a serious illness and not, for, not just for those with a terminal diagnosis. It is a team-based healthcare approach. That means there are at least two health providers who work collaboratively with patients and caregivers to the extent preferred by each patient. It may also include a spiritual leader, a mental health therapist, social workers, or additional components as needed to support the patient. The need for a palliative care can occur at any age and at any stage of a serious illness, including those who may, may be expected to recover. Palliative care can be provided in many settings, a hospital, a nursing home, or a private home, and may include curative care like chemotherapy. This bill is important to get everyone on the same page, and we hope that we all understand it better and can, and can be provided to more patients who need it. I additionally have provided Amendment 205, which is just a simple language cleanup to harmonize the definition of LB 345 with the HHS rules and regulations after I spoke with them. I have several experts coming up behind me, including representative from the Palliative Care Council, a Nebraska Hospice Association representative, and a physician who directly works with palliative care program at Children's Hospital. And they can provide um, more information on how they provide this care. I do have some uh, two friends in particular that have encountered this. One was a woman my age whose husband was diagnosed with incurable cancer and was in and out of the hospital for seven years during that term, seriously ill the entire time. So this is the exact kind of treatment that you would engage um, that type of patient with. And then another whose husband is still with us but has had stage four cancer for two and a half years already and has engaged the palliative care. Uh, treatment team to help negotiate the, the immense issues that happen while you're ha while you have a serious treatment also helps get the family involved because they go through an awful lot um, and it kind of helps have a seamless approach to a, a definitely bad issue um, so if there's any questions me. all right thank you for your opening are there any questions from the committee Senator Catwell. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you bringing this. It's some, an issue that's near and dear to my heart as well, and making the difference of understanding the difference between hospice and palliative care is such a significant thing. I know my mother-in-law passed away from cancer after a 10-year battle. And she did not have palliative care, and this would have been, and she did not want to do hospice for a lot of the reasons that people want to not have that end of life care. So just really appreciate it. And thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none. I'm assuming you're sticking around to close. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so with that, we will take our first testifier in support of LB 345. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, my name is Marcia, M-A-R-C-I-A. Fre frequently people think it's Marcia, but it's Marcia. Last name is Cederdahl, C-E-D-E-R-D-A-H-L. I'm a registered nurse. I'm also certified in palliative nursing. Um, I serve on the Nebraska Palliative Care and Quality of Life Advisory Council and I'm also a two-time cancer survivor. In 2017, Senator Mark Holterman introduced LB 323, which established the Palliative Care and Quality of Life Act. And this legislation created two entities, 
the palliative care, consumer, and professional information and education program in which the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services provides key palliative information via its website. And then the, the Palliative Care and Quality of Life Council, which consults and advises Nebraska DHHS on matters related to palliative care. The nine member council includes physicians and nurses certified under hospice and palliative medicine certification and other experienced palliative care professionals. The council is now in our sixth year and our goal continues to be increasing public awareness of palliative care and ensuring that all Nebraskans living with a serious illness have access to high quality palliative care that will improve their life and potentially reduce um, avoidable emergency department visits and as well as hospital visits. Um, as we've talked about, there continues to be much confusion about palliative care and who's eligible for the services. Passing this definition in Nebraska will create a shared understanding for what palliative care is. It is the specialized medical care for people living with a serious illness that carries a high risk of mortality or negatively impacts the quality of life. This type of care addresses the symptoms and stress of a serious illness, including pain. Uh, palliative care is team-based, providing care not just to the patient with a diagnosis, but their family and caregivers as well. And sometimes they need it more than the patient, um, which results in a better quality of life for everyone involved. Who is eligible? Palliative care is appropriate, appropriate at any age and at any stage of a serious illness. Actually, when, when someone's diagnosed with a serious illness, that's when palliative care should start. It's based on the needs of the patient, not their prognosis. It can be provided and often is provided along with curative treatment. Where it can be provided, it can be provided across all care settings, including hospitals, nursing facilities, uh, assisted living, skilled facilities, independent uh, living, outpatient clinics, and home. I was diagnosed with stage 2C colon cancer in June of 2012 and stage 3 parotid gland cancer in November of 2020. My treatment regimens have included surgery, chemotherapy, and 30 radiation treatments. I'm so blessed to still be here and to have oncologists who are certified in palliative medicine, sorry. As a career long hospice and palliative care nurse, a sister whose brother died from excruciating cancer battle in 2014, and as a survivor myself, I feel strongly there must be greater access to palliative care across Nebraska in both the urban and the rural areas. I know this isn't the case currently. Having a clear understanding of what palliative care is can assist with our council goal and help people across the state. My greatest hope is that having served on this palliative care and quality of life advisory council, I can use my personal and professional experience to ensure that all Nebraskans will have access to this essential care moving forward. Thank you for hearing my testimony. We want to be sure that all of your constituents are able to receive this type of care. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? I might have a couple. Sure. More about, since you're on the council, what the council actually does. You talk about the goals to increase a public awareness. How do you do that? Well, um, we, we have the website that we currently keep up to date. Um, and it's if you Google 
Nebraska DHHS and put in palliative care, the, the website will pop up. We meet quarterly and we have done a lot of education. Several, myself and several other members of the council um, started doing that probably in 2018. Had a bit of a slowdown during the pandemic because we couldn't get out, but tried to speak to all the different um, boards through DHHS. Um, a lot of public presentations, talking about it whenever we get the chance. Okay, so educational as well, mm -hmm. more to the department. Um, and anyone else who would ask. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Just kind of curious. We tend to have a lot of councils and boards and commissions and, and HHS, <laughs> yes. and so yeah. sometimes I always like to get a greater understanding of what each one means, what they do, you know, what their place mm -hmm. is, and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So I appreciate you filling us in on it too. Sure. So that helps us you all bet. out. So. Thank you for coming to testify. Oh, we might have one question. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Hansen. Um, and maybe you said something about this already. Does palliative care have to be prescribed or can it be prescribed? Or is it just if you want this service, you call and do you know? I mean, I, when he said, how, how does this get out? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, well, obviously, maybe doctor's offices or it sure can come that way you know one of the one of the areas we see it a lot is in the hospital there are physicians and nurse practitioners who specialize in palliative care the problem is once it gets out in the community there really isn't a lot of areas that provide community-based palliative care so hopefully this would help that um, i worked for the healthcare association for a couple of years and i would get people that would call me and say, how do I get, my doctor said I need palliative care. So a lot of times it starts with the physician. All right. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Take our next test of our support. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Hansen and members of the committee. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm Marilee Malcolm, M-A-R-I-L-E-E-M-A-L-C-O-M. -E -E I'm the Executive Director of Nebraska Hospice and Palliative Care Association. We're a statewide partnership to improve the quality of life for all Nebraskans who have chronic conditions or who are near end of life and to support the various communities who care for them. I'm a registered nurse, and I've worked in hospice for more than 20 years. I'm here today to support LB 345 and to help, which defines palliative care in Nebraska statute. Nebraskans use the term hospice and palliative care interchangeably, as though they are the same, when in fact, they are not the same. While hospice always includes palliative care through symptom management, psychosocial support, spiritual support, assistance with bathing, personal cares, volunteer support, nursing and physician expertise, hospice can only provide this care to patients who are in the last six months of their life and who are no longer seeking curative treatment for their disease. Patients with chronic and serious illness need support at every age, at every stage of, this, of their disease process from diagnosis until death, and so do their caregivers and families. Picture the three-year-old with a new diagnosis of cancer suffering from the side effects of chemotherapy. Um, picture the 29-year-old mom with a new diagnosis of MS, the father diagnosed with congestive heart failure following COVID-19, or the juvenile diabetic now in renal failure, and the list goes on. There are many Nebraskans who are diagnosed with serious illnesses every day who are seeking aggressive treatment, but need palliation of the symptoms of the disease and the side effects of the medications they're taking. They need emotional support, they need to understand their options, and they need a team. These patients may live with these disease processes for 20 years or more. They need palliative care services. They may only need it once, or they may need it intermittently throughout their disease process. <clears throat> palliative care teams prevent unwanted and unnecessary hospitalizations, improve quality of life, improve patient satisfaction and save costs for our healthcare systems. 
These seriously ill patients have a need for a team-based support in the community, and at this time, we can't offer it. The Council to Advance Palliative Care recommendation is to first define palliative care so then we can develop standards for this care. Their study shows we have some palliative care available in the larger hospitals across the state, but if you live in rural areas of Nebraska, like Senator Hardin and myself, this care is not available. Currently, we have very, very few providers going into the homes of patients living with serious illness to assist with their needs. At best, we can visit them when we're a patient in the hospital. So why do we need palliative care? We need to, or excuse me, why do we need to define palliative care? We need to define it to assure we understand these points. First, palliative care is a specialized medicine to improve quality of life for those with serious illness at any age and any stage and wherever that patient lives. Secondly, palliative care is not hospice. Patients can receive treatment for the symptoms of the disease or the side effects of their treatment and can receive curative treatment and palliative care at the same time. People are living longer and should be afforded a quality of life free from pain and suffering with a team of people working together to meet their needs, to answer their questions, to provide support, and assure that their wishes are honored throughout their disease process, just as hospice does at end of life. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in favor of Bill LB 345. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, there's only one letter in opposition and it's one sentence. And I just wanted to see if you could address it. It's from someone who's a psychiatrist who said they would support the bill if it specifically included mental illness as eligible for palliative care. And what I see doesn't prohibit mental illness. In your experience, does is mental illness something that can be covered under palliative care? Would that be appropriate? I'm going to have to honestly say I'm not prepared to answer that question. That's fine. You know, it's not been something that I've seen mentioned in any studies or literature that I've read on palliative care, but um, I'm going to defer to Dr. McFadden. He's going to testify next. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple questions sure. again. More like, again, in the interest of understanding all the, you know, different committees and uh, associations. So you got, I'm assuming you guys are based in Nebraska since you're Nebraska. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then what is the Council to Advance Palliative Care? Is that more I, federal? No, that was, I was referring to the, the Palliative Care Council that Governor Ricketts established. So I, okay. I believe okay. I'm Marcia and Dr. McFadden's council. Okay. Just wondering what that meant. Okay. Yes. All right. And do you guys do a lot of the same stuff that the Palliative Care and Quality of Life Council do? Like, do you educate, like, the public? Or, we do. Or? So we're the association that all of our members are involved in providing hospice, providing palliative care, or even some coalition members who may be providing those services to residents in their building through hospice agencies that serve there. So our role is to educate them, to advocate for um, hospice and palliative care in Nebraska, and um, to we have a statewide conference every year where we provide continuing education to credits to those people. Um, we provide expertise on regulatory issues if they have questions. Um, were the place that they call. So we were previously based in Lincoln, but when I became the director, we closed our office and moved it to my house. So I live in Cozad, Nebraska. Okay. All right. I just appreciate everything you get, you do. Thank and you. It's, it's having seen it multiple times, you know, in different arenas, whether it's in my home or whether it's in uh, hospitals, you know, I think it's very, very important. I think sometimes people don't feel alone or they don't feel you know, like anyone cares for them. And so it's nice to have somebody there to help them out. So. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. We will take our next test of our support. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for listening, uh, Chair Hansen, the committee members. 
I am Dr. Lena Bostwick, and I'm a registered nurse, and I've been a registered nurse for 39 years. I'm going to go off script just a little bit here because you've heard some testimony that I have as well in here. Um, for that 39 years, I've been in the hospital acute care setting for 29 years, and um, med surge, an ICU, a lot of different settings, and there are several times a registered nurse in acute care could bring up the topic of palliative care. And a lot of times it's resisted um, or families, patients don't know much about it and they have a fear of it, thinking it means hospice. Um, it does not. But a bill like this will help support and set the stage for those of us that can educate our patients and our families, we could refer to this definition that's given that seems so appropriate of what palliative care is. Um, you know, it's a specialized medical care and you, we've heard about this. I have a lot of um, evidence listed here in my letter, which you will get. Um, but I would just wanna point out, there can be some curative care and palliative care as, for example, my own father, who had a, a devastating stroke at the age of 59, lived in a nursing home for 15 years, and we finally, finally did get palliative care, and it was the best thing we ever did for him. Best thing ever. It took so much relief away from our own worry as a family and the care that he was getting. He could decide if he wanted his tube feeding um, if he needed some different kinds of medications, it would be discussed, and it was so incredibly um, powerful for the rest of his life. Um, you know, there's just so many diseases. Definition of serious illness is acquired or genetic conditions. Uh, my own father had to have, uh, he had esophageal stricture, so he often had to be dilated. You know, that's what he wanted because he wanted to be able to eat. But if he chose he didn't want to do that and wanted to just be more comfortable, that would have been just fine. It was what my dad wanted. Uh, you know, we talk, well, you've heard about children. There are 400,000 children are currently living with a serious illness. Uh, LB345 provides clarity on the definition, which we so badly need. Patients and families nav navigate conversations um, that are very difficult, and this just makes it so much easier. Um, you know, I, I do have uh, uh, evidence here that according to data from the National Cancer Institute Health Information National Trends, 71% uh, of U.S. adults never have heard of palliative care. Another study using the same data found that Americans who identified themselves as knowledgeable, 60% held at least one misperception. So revisions of this bill is an excellent rep representation of what palliative care means in Nebraska. It sets the stage like I had mentioned before. So the Nebraska Nurses Association asks that you would move LB 345 out of committee to general file. All right. Thank you for your testimony. You are very are there welcome. Any questions from the committee? Not seeing any. All right. Okay. Thank you for coming. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in support? Good morning, Chairman Hansen and members of the HHS committee. My name is Dr. Andrew McFadden, that's spelled A-N-D-R-E-W-M-A-C-F-A-D-Y-E-N. And I'm here today on behalf of the Nebraska Hospital Association and the Nebraska Palliative Care and Quality of Life Advisory Council in support of LB 345, which will define in state statute what palliative care is for all Nebraskans. I have the distinction of being the first board certified pediatric hospice and palliative care doctor in Nebraska. Um, for almost 17 years now, I've been the medical director of the Pediatric Palliative Care Program at Children's Hospital and Medical Center, uh, during which time our palliative care team has served nearly 1,000 children from all parts of Nebraska who are going through serious life-limiting illnesses by providing guidance, care coordination, and symptom relief to make their lives and the lives of their families better. 
Our patients have a multitude of medical and ancillary specialists and must navigate home health care companies, insurance companies, and even school systems. Their homes are sometimes mini ICUs equipped with home nurses and medical technologies such as monitors, BiPAP machines, mechanical ventilators, oxygen tanks, and feeding pumps. Plus, they usually have a garage stacked floor to ceiling with medical supplies. In 2018, we published a study showing that on average, our palliative care families in Nebraska provide 73 hours a week of direct patient care to their children. They also miss 23 hours of work every week on average because of shortages in home nursing care. Beyond that, our families are faced with monumental, life-altering, sometimes life and death choices that they must make for their child. We help them navigate those choices in line with their values. With all that our families are facing, medical, financial, emotional, and spiritual burdens, the extra layer of support palliative care provides is vital to their success. Sometimes we can rejoice with the families when a cure is found. Most of the time we will celebrate small wins wherever we can find them. And sometimes we cry with them when the illness is too much and their child dies. Regardless of the circumstance though, we are always there for the family, providing support to them along with their primary medical team to make sure their quality of life is the best it can be. We are there for them walking hand in hand. So why do we need a definition of palliative care in the statutes? Well, most people associate palliative care with hospice and dying, even though the vast majority of our patients are not actively dying. Currently, palliative care is only mentioned in the state hospice statutes. We would like the clear and separate definition of palliative care in LB 345 to help us overcome the confusion between hospice and palliative care. This confusion exists among medical professionals, payers, and lay people alike. The confusion is understandable though. Hospice and palliative care are often lumped together since the principles of palliative care underpin the practice of hospice. The differences are very important though. Palliative care helps improve quality of life from the beginning of their illness, even when the patient is not actively dying, even if a cure is possible. In addition, having palliative care involved at the beginning of an illness improves the transition to hospice later if that transition is needed. The need for palliative care and the practice of palliative care is growing steadily in Nebraska. The definition in LB 345 will help us to set standards in the future and give guidance to medical professions who want to join the effort in providing palliative care in a variety of settings across the state. It's time to set palliative care apart. Thank you for your consideration. I kindly ask you to advance LB 345 from the committee. And I'm betting I'll have some questions. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? I actually no. don't have any, so. Okay. So I, can I address the question about the mental health? Yes, yes the, you may, sure. Mental illness. So there's, there really would be no reason why mental illness would not qualify for palliative care. Probably the biggest impediment is just everybody's bandwidth. Um, they don't, you know, people just don't have enough. There, there aren't enough uh, resources for that. But, but the current definition would include. Would not, would not um, exclude. exclude mental health, mental illness. It didn't read like it did, so yeah. I just wanted to offer that. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Okay. The definition of palliative care that we're, that we're um, introducing in this bill, is that typically a definition that most hospitals use, like such as your pal pediatric palliative care team? Uh, yes, so it, it is, and, and also that's um, written, uh, it's in line with national organizations as well. Okay, we're just putting in a statute so we have it clear definition correct for the most part. Okay. correct all right thank Great. you and thank you for your testimony the next testifier in support welcome good morning senators uh good morning chair hansen and senators of the health and human services committee my name is adrian sanchez spelled a-d-r-i-a-n last name sanchez s-a-n-c-h-e-z and I am here on behalf of the Nebraska Association for Home Healthcare and Hospice. Um, please submit into, or please accept into record this letter submitted on behalf of Executive Director Janet Sailhoff uh, in support of LB 345. Uh, unfortunately, she could not be with us here today. Um, we would like to thank Senator Armendariz for introducing this bill, and we respectfully request the committee's support of LB 345 to help ensure Nebraskans are fully aware of this care option 
as a way to ensure that they or a loved one receive the support they need to help preserve their quality of life. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, uh, and I want to thank you for your time and consideration on this matter. So. Thank you. Short and sweet. I like it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any questions for me? Yes, Senator Reepy. I have a question. Uh, I simply want to get it on the table so that we don't have a wave at the close. And, and my question there is, is the advisory council a volunteer group? And I don't know whether you're... No, I am not familiar with that as I am not. Any other one that I would try to get on the table would be the, you know, the commercial, is it a commercial or Medicaid insurance? Is it reimbursable? So... I think that's what I'm this definition helps lay the, the stage sure. for, is to help define it in statute so that we can get recognition of it and potentially coverage of it. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? So just to be clear, you are separate from the Nebraska Hospice and Palliative Care Association. Correct, we are, yes. The Nebraska Association for Home Health Care and Hospice. Yes, yes, we have a number of members that do both home health care as well as in-home hospice services, so. That's... Okay, do you do much with palliative care or is it more to kind of strictly more the hospice side of it? So because it's defined in the state, we do have some members that provide palliative care that are hospice providers but we don't necessarily have home health members that provide palliative services, but this definition may open the doorway for that to okay. occur. Yeah. Awesome. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Is there anybody wish, anybody else wishing to testify on support? Welcome. Good morning, Chair Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Gina Ragland, J-I-N-A-R-A-G-L-A-N-D. Here today on behalf of ARP Nebraska testifying in support of LB 345. ARP strongly believes that all individuals have the right to be self-reliant and live with dignity and respect and we support efforts to update the definition and improve access to palliative care services and the elimination of barriers as outlined in LB 345. Most people hear the words palliative care and think hospice but they are different types of care and much of what you've heard today Hospice is reserved for when curative treatments have been exhausted and patients have less than six months to live. Palliative care is a team-based medical specialty focused on providing relief from the symptoms and stress of serious illness. It's based on need and not prognosis and can be appropriate at any age and during any stage of any illness, often provided alongside curative treatments, such as chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. Palliative care can have an enormous impact on the quality of life and outcomes in people experiencing serious or terminal illness and to support their families and their caregivers. Some of the benefits include symptom management support, improved quality of life, reduced risks of depression, longer survival, support in making decisions, and support again for family members and caregivers, and overall improved caregiver satisfaction. To illustrate the importance of palliative care, I want to share with you a story of David Griffiths, who's one of our members. David couldn't breathe and the 69 year old had been losing his voice for months and had woke up grasping, uh, gasping for breath and was admitted to the hospital. The next day an ear, nose and throat doctor probed his throat and discovered a huge white tumor wrapped around his larynx, crushing his windpipe, his esophagus and his vocal cords. Doctors rushed him into surgery to place a breathing tube in his throat and over the next few days inserted a feeding tube in his stomach and a port in his shoulder for delivering medication. He would need five kinds of chemotherapy plus radiation to shrink the tumor and kill the cancer. He'd spend the next six months traveling to and from the hospital several times a week for outpatient treatment and IV rehydration. He was unable to work and had to avoid public places and being around people because he couldn't risk catching an infection. The unrelenting pain in his neck made it nearly impossible for him to sleep. But unlike most people who enter the hospital with a severe illness, Mr. Griffiths had a secret source of strength, his palliative care team. Comprising a specially trained doctor, nurses, and other practitioners, the team helped him deal with the pain, stress, and logistics of his treatment. In addition to making sure he was on the right dosage of morphine, his palliative care team helped him get rides to and from the hospital, provided a nutritionist, helped coordinate his care with all of his, uh, all of his other doctors, and answered his, any questions he had in between visits. Why should someone have to be dying to have someone focus on their quality of life? People who get palliative care feel better, avoid preventable 911 calls, ER visits, and hospitalizations, and they stay independent and in better control at home. 
They have someone who can help in a crisis arises in the middle of the night. And a palliative care provider acts like a quarterback, working closely with the other team members, nurses, chaplains, social workers, patients, other doctors, and, and anyone else that's involved in the team. Communication is critical because one of the major issues people living with serious illness face is the fragmentation of our healthcare system. Communication through palliative care is easier by coordinating care. The specialist focuses on treating the disease, prolonging their life, and ideally curing them while the palliative care team focuses on everything else. Approximately 6 million people in the U.S. have a need for palliative care, but most patients don't know about their options. The grave majority who could benefit from care are not getting it and often due to the misunderstanding of what it actually is. ARP believes that patients should have access to improved palliative care, including better treatment for emotional distress and the elimination of all barriers to the appropriate management of pain and suffering, improve access to palliative care services regardless of the patient's setting, including excluding limitations based on life expectancy, and the prohibition on the use of acute and other curative services, much like you heard of when I uh, talked about Mr. Griffiths. For these reasons, ARP strongly supports 345 and would ask the committee to support and advance the bill. We would like to thank Senator Armendariz for introducing the legislation and for the inter uh, opportunity to comment. And I'd also like to thank the committee for your time. I know you've had a very long week, so I appreciate your, your listening today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else wishing to testify in support of LB 345? Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Marion Miner, M-A-R-I-O-N, M-I-N-E-R. And I'm here today on behalf of the Nebraska Catholic Conference, which advocates for the public policy interests of the Catholic Church and advances the gospel of life through engaging, educating, and empowering public officials, Catholic laity, and the general public. I am here today to express the conference's support for LB 345 which would define palliative care and distinguish it more clearly from hospice. Uh, the conference has been supportive of public policy that promotes palliative care and makes it more available for many, many years. And I'll go ahead and, and make my plan testimony much briefer so as not to be too repetitive. Um, but I will just say uh, palliative care recognizes and addresses not only physical, but also psychological, emotional, and spiritual symptoms resulting from illness and suffering. Palliative care is not reserved for one specific group or purpose. It exists for the benefit of all who suffer. LB 345 makes that clearer. Mitigating the negative effects of suffering, physical, psychological, social, or spiritual, is a moral good. It would benefit the general public and those in the medical professions to know that palliative care can be offered alongside curative treatment and in its greater scope, accomplishes something equally important to curative treatment. It values and recognizes the whole person. For these reasons, the conference supports LB 345 and we encourage you to advance it to general file. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to testify in support? All right, seeing none, is there anybody who wishes to testify in opposition to LB 345? Seeing none, is there anybody who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity to LB 345? Seeing none, we will welcome back Senator Armendariz to close. And with that, we did have three letters in support of LB 345 and zero in opposition. Thanks. I just want to thank everybody for coming um, and testifying for this bill. And thank you so much as a committee for listening to us. And hopefully we have shared the importance of what we're trying to do here with LB 345. Um, I have to also say this does not have a fiscal note because that's important to me. <laughs> All right. Any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Riffey. Yeah, thank you for closing. I appreciate that. My question was then if there's no fiscal note, then there's no, your volunteers in terms of the council. I, I haven't talked to them in particular whether their volunteers are paid. Can you help me out too? Is this reimbursable, a service reimbursable under a nice 
office visit codes. I, I have known people that have taken advantage of it, but I have, haven't asked them on how their insurance pays for it. They were engaged in a hospital setting um, and directed to, you should probably engage palliative care at this point. I'm just also curious for Medicaid's add on it. Just Thank yeah, you. hopefully that's a possibility to open it up for uh, more reimbursement for the people that need it. I think this is a good care bill, so thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions? I think for clarity, I think with the original bill, LB 323 with Senator Coltsman, I think there was a fiscal note when they first started it, and that's pretty much, so I think they are volunteers, but I think they get a per diem for their meetings and stuff like that, but it's minimal, from my understanding. So. All right, thank you thank for you. your closing. And with that, we will close the hearing on LB 345, and we will now open the hearing for LB 548, and welcome Senator Bo Ballard. I'm just glad the, the pharmacists don't care about natural hair braiding. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. <laughs> All right. Good morning, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Commit Committee. My name is Bo Ballard. For the record, that's B-E-A-U, B-A-L-L-A-R-D. I represent Legislative District 21, which is Northwest Lincoln and Northern Lancaster County. I'm here today to introduce Legislative Bill, Bill 548, which makes changes to the examination and compounding requirement under the Pharmacy Practice Act. Under section one of the bill, it amends section L or it amends section 38, 2852, which contains provisions relating to the required examination of jurisprudence in the pharmacy examination. Under the law, the applicant of the, the, uh, the licensure as a pharmacist is required to obtain a grade of exactly 75%. LB 548 would clarify the issue by removing the Pacific grade requirement in statute and authorizing the Board of Pharmacy to determine the grade requirement for the examination. Under section two of the bill, the person authorized to compound the process of, mi of combining, mixing, and altering ingredients to create a medication to be tailored to the needed of individual patients would require to be a compliance with the standards of chapter uh, 795 and 797 of the United States of pharmacopoeia and national formulary existence on January 1, 2023. Current law references the standard as they exist on January 1 of 2015. I encourage the committee to advance LB 548 to general file and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for that. Is there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Day. Thank you, Chair Hinson. Uh, Senator Ballard, is this your first bill introduction? This would be my third. Oh, it's your third. Well, you did excellent. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, we'll see it close. Yeah. All right. Of course. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll take our first testifier in support of LB 548. Welcome. Chairman Hanson, members of the committee, my name is Robert J. Holstrom, H-A-L-L-S-T-R-O-M. I appear before you today as registered lobbyist for the Nebraska Pharmacists Association in support of LB 548. Uh, my wife always tells me I have a way of clearing out a room, and I've pretty much done it again today. Uh, I hope that doesn't detract from the importance uh, of the bill. When I uh, first approached Senator Ballard, uh, you know, sometimes... Uh, Bills are presented and we say they make technical corrections. I think I'm pretty confident that this is clearly a technical corrections bill. Uh, Senator Ballard has done a nice job of telling you about the twofold purpose of LB 548. Uh, the first one is to address the uh, applications that uh, is uh, connected with the uh, request for licensure as a pharmacist. There are two specific exams. One is a uh, exam regarding proficiency in pharmacy knowledge. The second, which is referred to as a jurisprudence exam, is one that de demonstrates proficiency in both state and federal pharmacy law knowledge. Uh, the technical aspect of this is that the statute does specifically say that a grade of 75 is required. It does not say at least 75. And in fact, my understanding is that this exam is uh, being graded on a pass-fail basis. So we're just making that technical correction and putting it in the board's hands uh, to make that determination. 
The second issue, uh, which is also somewhat technical, we have many bills before the legislature that make references to federal laws, standards, or regulations. Uh, this is another one of those. Uh, this particular reference to the USP Chapter 795 and 797 have not been updated since January 1 of 2015. There have, in fact, been some very significant changes uh, as of November of 2022 uh, that will be updated by uh, enhancing that reference to January 1st of 2023. Uh, I had told Senator Ballard that I was going to have a pharmacist here today. Unfortunately, there was a conflict at the last minute. Uh, I can do some basic explanation of compounding if the committee is interested, uh, but I'm certainly, Senator Hansen, not going to be mistaken for that witness that you said earlier looked like she knew everything. Yeah. So, uh, but basically when we talk about compounding, it's putting together pursuant to a prescription order, uh, a medication that for some reason or another, the patient might not be uh, able to tolerate the commercially available drug, whether it's due to uh, the dosage or intolerance to a specific ingredient contained within the drug. And then we look under chapters 795 and 797 to two separate types of compounding, uh, sterile and non-sterile. Uh, that doesn't have to do anything with clean and unclean. It has to do with the purpose for which the compounded medication is used. Uh, when we look at sterile compounding, that involves typically injections, infusions, or applications to the eye, while non-sterile medications include production of solutions, suspensions, ointments, creams, powders, suppositories, capsules, and tablets. And there are a whole list of standards uh, that pharmacist must comply with, uh, with regard to USP 795 and 797. Uh, those uh, standards will go into effect. They were adopted in November of 2022. Uh, they have until November of 2023 to be in compliance, but this will update it so that they will be applicable uh, to those actions on a going forward basis. I would ask the committee to uh, advance the bill and I'd be happy to address any questions that you might have. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? I just learned the difference between sterile and non-sterile uh, products. That's, I didn't know that either. So, Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in support? Seeing none. Is there anybody who wishes to testify in opposition to LB 548? Seeing none. Is there anybody who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Seeing none, we will welcome Senator Ballot is waiving closing. So with that, I will close the hearing for LB 548 and close our hearings for this morning. We, we come back at 1.30. Yeah. About an hour. Easy, easy. Done, I like that you waved that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Waves closing. The friendliest oh, committee we are. The friendliest committee. <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally great. Like this room, I was on the